Hi, this is Daniela Camboni, and welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show here on ITM Trading. If you found me and have continued to follow me on my journey, thank you. If you have not yet, I urge everyone to please subscribe uh, to the channel and to DanielaCamboni.com. All right, let's get to our segment today, and please welcome to the show a uh, longtime friend and commentator, Peter Grandich of Peter Grandich and Company. Peter, always good to see you. Same here, Daniela, and best best wishes for great success at this position of yours now. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to bring you on. Obviously, uh, we're speaking today, and, and Jerome Powell is uh, is slated to speak. Um, and he's basically, if I had to sum up, having a tough job getting the market to believe him when he says that interest rates will stay high through 2024. I mean, if we just look at the bond market, Peter, which I would argue is really... Um, where you should look if you're following monetary policy, it's telling us that they're done cutting, but they're trying. To, they're still trying to convince us they're not. Why? And and how do you see things? Well, I think one of the reasons is their concern is that it could lead to frothiness again. Frothiness that uh, they felt was part of the issue, even though they were the main culprit that caused it in the first place. And of course, if, if if they perceive that there's a need for that, and yet bonds continue to rally, it, it's self-defeating. It takes away from what they're hoping to achieve. So, the jawboning has always been something standard from a from a Fed chairman, and he's no different. But it is a challenge. There's a great belief now, and it's one of the reasons that the stock market rallied, that interest rates have peaked and somehow are going to go back to uh, Wonderland where they'll be low and happy days and the Fed will be able to provide ample supply of money and stocks can only go up in that atmosphere. That's clearly what the don't worry, be happy crowd is banking on and been betting on in recent weeks. I mean, and if we look at the talk of, of recession, I mean, we know there was such a focus on that in, in 2023 and then obviously the economy defied expectations. But if we look at indicators from the inverted yield curve to a potentially cooling job market, I mean, do you think that recession is a real risk now for 2024? Yeah, you know, recessions are, I forget the old saying, recession was when, when your friend is out of work, depression is when you were. The The employment picture is, is, is very fuzzy. First of all, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which really should drop the L and just be called BS because that's what it's been for almost a year. We've had almost 12 straight months of numbers that come out and get readjusted dramatically lower. And there's a lot of fudging with the birth model. But what one thing people don't focus on, which is really important, and why there's such a discrepancy between them and the ADP number almost every month, is the Bureau of Labor Statistics will take somebody that now has to work three jobs in order to do what one job used to do a few years ago, and they count it as three people employed when it's really one person having to do three jobs to keep their head above water. There's a lot of discrepancies in the employment number and the employment picture. And of course, the key factor is, is that wages are not keeping up what we know inflation to be versus what's reported. Inflation always tends to be really higher than what the government comes up with because there's a bias there to keep it as low as possible. Well, Americans definitely still feeling the crunch. And I want to talk more about this with you, Peter. You already you know, alluded to it there. That you know, a new study out, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. The typical American household must now spend an additional eleven thousand four hundred thirty-four dollars annually just to maintain the same standard of living they enjoyed in January of twenty twenty-one, right before inflation soared to forty-year highs. I mean, a lot of people point the fingers to to the finger to Bidenomics and obviously to, to Fed Powell. I mean, is that a fair criticism? And you know, what do you just make of of this staggering statistic? I say this seriously, not to be sarcastic. I don't know what bionomics is. I don't think it's been truly identified, certainly from the economics that I learned over 40 years. Uh, but whatever you want to call it, there's no question about it that for the vast majority of people, it's been a struggle. And a struggle which can easily be seen also, just talk to any food bank in any part of the country, and they'll tell you how not only how many more people are online, but working class now that has to appear there. And an interesting statistic, which you pointed out, almost two thirds working paycheck to paycheck. How many people that are earning over 100,000 and are still working paycheck to paycheck? Yes, yes. So, 
it, it, for for the upper echelon, yeah, it's maybe life as usual. But for the vast majority of Americans, it's a struggle to keep their head above. And unfortunately, many are slipping, and some of it's slipping uh, very hard at this yeah. point in time. Yeah, Especially, I, the, sorry, Jenna. No, no, youth, please. The, how many people have had to move back? I, I live in a 55 and over community, and you're only supposed to keep uh, – guests, so to speak, here for less than a month. But how many now children have actually come back? And children of 30 or 40 years age, not 25, you know, that old, are living with their parents again because it's such a struggle out there now for the cost of living. Uh, look where, you know, New York City, what it, what, what, what it, what it costs just to, to, to keep something above water. So these are things that are not showing up in the numbers or maybe the stock market is not appreciating, but it and a whole bunch of other fundamental problems really are going to make things much more difficult as, as 2024 takes hold. I mean, how much of this do you think will be part of the political platform and, and campaign trail, Peter? I mean, you're already seeing the debates uh, starting. I'm not sure if you caught last night's on, on, on Fox between DeSantis and, and, and Newsom. Um, which had some very, you know, heated moments and actually one I want to bring up with you. But how much of this will be the forefront uh, of the political campaign of inflation and Americans just trying to survive here? I mean, really, the, the, the middle class and the lower class. I think in America's history, only the Civil War leading up to it was America more divided than it is now. And how divided it is, is not only do the two parties cannot really in a sense being the same room with each other. But we now see people within their own parties disliking other members of that party. So how can we expect those groups to sit down and handle some of the harsh things that we're gonna to have to deal with here? And a political race that where one person is racing is facing, I don't know how many different charges over different areas and who knows what the outcome's gonna be there. And the other person that's supposed to be the lead candidate, we don't even know if he really has the mental capabilities to continue and certainly serve another four years. And it would not shock me at all, Danielle, and I'm not predicting this, but this is what you have to leave open, that come election day, there may be at least one, if not two different people running for president than people now assume. And that uncertainty in the political environment will really kick in next year. People aren't gonna be concerned during this happy atmosphere, which is always yeah. Thanksgiving to New Year's, but politics is gonna come a more important role on all markets in 2024. Yes. And I think people are, are, you know, when you speak to people, they're fed up about the state of the city they're living in. I mean, if you speak about cities like, you know, San Francisco or New York City, the most expensive city, uh, in the world right now. And yet, if you look at the city, you're thinking, you know, I'm paying all this money to be surrounded by, by what? And here's, I'm just going to quote uh, DeSantis uh, when he was uh, debating Newsom, when Newsom was saying, you know, California is a freedom state. DeSantis's reply was, yeah, you have the freedom to defecate in public in California. You have the freedom to pitch a tent on Sunset Boulevard. You have the freedom to create a homeless encampment under a freeway and light it on fire. You have the freedom to have an open air drug market. You have the freedom that if you're an illegal alien to get all these taxpayer benefits. I mean, would you not argue that this is the sentiment of, of, of many Americans just fed up with what they're seeing? Yeah, and it's a sentiment that's growing worldwide now of very strict mm -hmm over controlled by governments governments basically saying it's our way it's our way or the highway uh clearly uh the exodus of people from california is a is a is a demonstration of truly what a lot of people really feel what california is about and many people that i still speak to that are in california are trying to figure out how they can get it to get out of california i have yet to talk to anybody this year that told me they can't wait to get to california so i think that's an example of and it's not limited to california states like cities like new york chicago uh are seeing great exodus and uh it, it's a demonstration of really, in a sense, how divided this country is becoming. I want to get your thoughts. I don't know if you caught Elon Musk's big uh, unveiling of his futuristic looking cyber truck. It's the first electric vehicle Tesla offers that isn't a sedan and marks the company's entry into the growing EV pickup market. Uh, but the interesting thing I found was that he promises the cyber truck has this feature over the competitors that it's bulletproof. I mean, he even cited Al Capone and he said it's basically a, a truck for the ap apocalypse. And he also tweeted 
um, the thought of an apocalypse feels a little closer every year. Now he's, you know, come out with a bulletproof cyber truck. I mean, is this the direction we're headed in that we're going to need bulletproof cars and this is the selling feature? You know what uh, Trump was to politics, Elon Musk has been to billionaires. He's very different. Uh, he speaks his mind. And, you know, one thing I would add also is that imagine if he didn't take Twitter. What we now know, would we've ever known it? We've learned so much of his acquisition of Twitter and how mm -hmm. things were running and all. Uh, Daniel, I've never been in the camp of apocalypse uh, because of my fate. I don't yes. want to own gold because somehow I'm going to be able to buy a loaf of bread when others couldn't. And besides, there'll still be people around that don't have it, will realize I have the gold and I won't have a big enough army to fend them off. So I don't I don't get caught up and I'm not concerned. But when you think about that, just entering regular thinking that we need bulletproof some type of trucks in order to live, really paints the picture of how serious the issues are politically, mm -hmm. socially and economically here and elsewhere throughout the world. Exactly. And I'm glad you brought up gold, um, because for this audience that may be new to you, Peter, I mean, you've been uh, in gold for the longest time. You've always never touched Bitcoin. I mean, why do you why do you uh, or why did you always gravitate towards gold and silver? So it's interesting you bring that up because I got an email earlier this week from somebody uh, telling me, boy, I really blew it. You know, I left the stock market in 2021 and look how it's rallied and you're in gold and it's a poor performer and all the other things they call it relics and they call me a relic, a dinosaur, all that stuff. <laughs> and then I statistically showed and I published it that since January 1st, 2000, which I think is a fair, this whole new millennium, gold is up 693 percent. And the stock market based on the Dow is up 267 percent. I mean, that is it's mind boggling to hear and still the Main Street, Wall Street will look at gold as kryptonite. And yet for something that worked for a couple thousand years, which I don't see anywhere any expiration date on it, that somehow now it won't work the way it did for 2000 and something years. In fact, I think now because of what's happening, it's more useful now than probably any time in my 40 year career. I just view it as first and foremost, an alternative to paper currency, something that I think I would want to own before any other paper currency that's out there. Two, I also look at it as for capital appreciation. Look, since just 2022, when we were in the 1600s, we're up 400 and something dollars. We're up 25, 30%. I, I, I'm very happy with that. And I'm also happy that it has a lot of other uses other than capital appreciation. And so, and and I don't want to get started, but I call it Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin, whatever you want to name it, is the single biggest hyped investment product that ever existed. Will it still exist and be around? Yeah, just like penny stocks will always be around and all. Is it everything everybody talked about a few years ago? No, it isn't, because how I know this is this. A few years ago, Larry Fink at BlackRock basically called it garbage, called it horrible, wouldn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Now, nothing's changed in its technology use. Everything people were claiming back then still claim that Bitcoin can do. Yet suddenly this gentleman thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Right. Why? Well, because they're going to make try to make a lot of money trading it. So uh, I, 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 I just think gold is something that's very dependable. Uh, has a historical history uh, that has withstood all sorts of civilizations and, and paper monies that were once king and gone, and here it still is. And because most financial service industry still treats it as a relic, is always going to, the contrary of me, is going to say I need to be involved with it. I also want to get your thoughts on what's happening uh, in the oil market. I mean, we saw Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, you know, deepen their oil supply cuts. Peter announcing an agreement to continue scaling back production at the beginning of 2024. Now, uh, that hasn't, you know, caused a spike in oil prices yet. But um, how closely are you watching what's happening in, in the oil market here? Well, extremely closely. But I think there was news in the past few days that was dramatic. And we'll, you, you'll, you'll end up talking about it and the effect they'll have in the coming months. UAE stopping. Yeah. To use the dollar for oil trades. Dollars for oil transitions. The Saudis, well, already, 
The Saudis have already spoken about that. I believe the BRIC situation, uh, which is so under covered and, and understood and really analyzed by Main Street, Wall Street, will be one of the biggest impacts on all investments in the next one to three years. It will rival what uh, world trade became after World War I. That's yeah. how important what is developing there. It's happening methodically. They're doing things as they approach. They're selling U.S. assets. They're unifying themselves as abilities to trade and all. And one day, and still maybe years away, we're going to wake up to an alternative, at least, to the U.S. dollar that they're using, even if it's simply just trading in their own currencies without, as Saudis and China's just did regarding the oil, or introduce some sort of new alternative or some type of commodity base likely because that's going to be back some by gold because that's why they've been such buyers of it and it's it's laughed at it's scoffed at by main street wall it street is. and the financial media and one day they're going to wake up and go and and, and people you know i i joke this i said to a person the most typical financial advisor if you ask them about if an investor asks them, what do you think of this brick situation? They'll go, I don't cover the housing industry. I mean, they really don't know a thing about it. And yet it's happening and so yep. pronounced. If you get outside of America media and follow what the financial media in other areas of the world is speaking about, they're focused on the brick situation. I'm happy you bring this up because I've interviewed some experts who, who follow the bricks, say they follow the bricks, but discounted so quickly, Peter. And I'm always a little surprised by that because I'm looking at thinking, well, already their GDP is far greater than that of the U.S. Look at their energy dominance over the U.S. I mean, that in itself should be, you know, terrifying. And the pushback I get is, well, do you really think that they're ever going to agree anything? Do you really think you're ever going to get China and Russia uh, to not have a power play. Do you really think China is going to listen to any of the other other countries sitting at the table with them? Well, I'll tie it into something else that I've been involved with for years, as you know, involved in the mining and exploration industry. My answer to that is 20 or 30 years ago, I could have spun on a globe anywhere, pointed a finger and say, boy, we can go there and explore and not have any worries. You can't say that now. It's much more difficult areas of the world that things that are happening the same is in terms of where america is accepted or viewed as it was 20 or 30 years ago it's changed dramatically for the worst uh there are a whole host of reasons for that and quite frankly if i'm the brick nations i would hope that people keep speaking like that because they're able to keep selling their u.s assets which they're doing they're actually unifying and been able to acquire huge sums of gold without driving it up too much and when it went up and all and one day we're just going to wake up and and, and the, the bell or the, the straw that broke the camel's back was not only how Biden, when he went over, when we were having our energy crisis and what happened with him and the Saudis and how they viewed the lack of how he was carried himself, but really what the Saudis have said since then and that they are now willing to look at and explore uh, other than the U.S. dollar. And, and when it's only a matter of time for that to happen. And. I don't see the typical financial service industry here preparing their investors in any way, shape or form for them from the impact of that. Peter, I always love your explanation of things. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to come on today. And as you could see, I wore my, my Jets colors for you. And if I could share a story, just so you understand the type of person we're dealing with, Peter Grandich, because he loves he loves pulling pranks on people or surprising people. I get a message from Peter the other day. Daniela, call me. So I call him. I think, what's happening? What's going on? And somebody else answers the phone. Uh, you want me to say who it is? <laughs> so I've been blessed, as you know, and you can see from what's left of it. Yeah. <laughs> the years I worked with professional athletes and my favorite, he was my favorite of all time. He's my best friend. I've been with him more than anybody else other than my wife or daughter the last 25 years. And that's who I consider the greatest New York Jet ever. And that's Joe Klecko. And uh, so we were out to lunch. You would communicate it. And I said, well, call me. And I, I let and him answer. Answered. I guess you so, were a little bit surprised. I was a little bit surprised and, and flustered. But oh, it was just it was just that's just who Peter Grandich is. Um, does Aaron Rodgers come back before year end? Well, 
never say never because when I left the sports world over three years ago, I swore <laughs> I would never step in a stadium right. again. But I'm actually going Saturday because Joe, part of an alumni weekend for the Jets, asked me to go with him. So I'm actually going to actually go up to the game on Sunday. I, I don't see him. I, I, I can see him getting ready. And if somehow they win the next couple games and still are alive, does he step in at the end of the year? Yeah, even if he does, as Joe and others have told me, he's not going to be the same Aaron Rodgers. And the risk he'd be putting himself at yeah. with an offensive line that really is highly questionable. I know you're Jeff, but they're not really that good. I don't know if he wants to get behind that line at this point <laughs> in time. Uh, uh, well, you're not wrong there. Peter, you know I'm going to uh, ask you to come back for our tradition of your um, holiday message. So we'll see you again in December. But in the meantime, thank you. Thank you again. And thank you so much for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way. So be sure to sign up at DaniellaCombone.com and subscribe to our channel so you stay on top of all this incredible content. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.